While the world continues to talk about a new world order, God is planning a new world order of his own. That's next on The Prophetic Connection. For several decades now, there has been much talk about a new world order, a kind of a utopia where there are no more wars and all the nations get along. In more recent times, it, the buzzword is globalization, the idea that we're uh, one world community and uh, we can all cooperate together and things will be fine. The truth is that God is planning a new world order of his own because he doesn't like what he sees in the order of the world as it is now, the sin, the wickedness, the violence, all of these things are an affront to Almighty God. So as John continues to see this panoramic vision of the future that Christ revealed to him, as we get toward the end, we're introduced to the new world order that John saw. He describes it in Revelation 21 uh, with these words. In verse one, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. I've officiated at I, perhaps hundreds of funerals during uh, my ministry. And often at the graveside, I would read that passage along with others that give hope to the bereaved, those that are standing by the open grave. It's a wonderful word of hope that is given through the writings of the Apostle John and of course that came to him from none other than Jesus the risen Christ. The only question is when will all of this take place? When will God introduce his new world order? What exactly is God's new world order? God's new world order is really not a new world order. It's something that he has planned uh, from the beginning, from the beginning of time, from the foundation of the world, uh, when he created mankind. He created humans to be a part of his kingdom uh, and a kingdom that he will rule uh, for an eternity. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else that we need will be added. Uh, and Israel was chosen as the example, the model of God's kingdom, and it shows that God intends to rule every area of society. He intends to mold uh, and shape culture. He intends to rule government, education, health care, uh, the family. He intends to rule every aspect of our lives. This is what is going to be established when our king rules. Why is a new order necessary? We see increasingly lawlessness in the world. Terrorism is rampant in so much of the world today. Rebellion against authority. These are all predicted in the scriptures concerning the last days. We need God's world order where he puts everything in place and he brings a system based on love, peace, joy. The present fallen world order fits the conditions of human beings that are not redeemed. So it is fitting for us to live under this world that Paul describes as groaning and travail. But God's ultimate design, his ultimate good design, is to be in fellowship with human beings in community forever and ever, where he will be our God and we'll be his people and he will dwell in our midst forever. And the new world order fits that context of fellowship and communion with God and one another. 
the beauty and the glory of that new order is the fitting environment for a redeemed people. When will God introduce or bring about his new world order? God's new world order really is a, is a picture of heaven on earth. And these tribulations, the wars and rumors and wars of, of our times, the difficulties of our times leading up to the great tribulation and, uh, and the bowls of wrath being poured out on, on humanity, Armageddon and these things, they're, they're leading us up to this incredible climax. And I would say it as a redemptive purifying process on, on humanity. It's almost as if we have to go through tribulation in order for humans to be to be ready for this. And so when he rules and reigns, we have the beginning of the new heavens and the new earth, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God that was shown to John the Revelator. And then God's new order really is, is the establishment of his, of his kingdom and his sovereignty over every aspect of human life, but over every aspect of the world. I always say that one of the things that differentiates biblical faith from the other world religions is that in the age to come, forever we'll be able to hug each other. A disembodied soul has it, you can't put your arms around somebody and give them a hug. And I want to give my wife a hug forever. And that's the difference. We believe in the resurrection of the body and a resurrection of a real earth and a resurrection of real community and all kinds of flora and fauna, all kinds of plants and animals and all kinds of beauties and visions and vistas. Don't go away. After this short break, Dr. John Twee returns with his teaching. You know, for all that's wrong with our world, at least from God's perspective and high standards, it really is a beautiful place. This morning I'm standing here, I can hear the birds uh, singing in the background. Ground. And at night, if you look up at a, a, a sky that's lit by the stars, myriads of stars and galaxies, and this incredible creation that we have the pleasure of living in, or even standing on a seashore, um, walking along and the waves lapping at your feet. These are the things that we enjoy. We were created for God's pleasure, but God created the world for our pleasure. But all is not well with the words, the world. So the Bible tells us that God is going to change things. Or he's going to create something new because what exists today is not at the level of the standards that are good enough for him. Standards of righteousness and man is falling far short uh, of those standards of righteousness. So as John the Apostle continues to see this, these glorious visions of the future, um, we get to Revelation 21, and we have a new world order being created. In fact, not just a new world order. As the vision continues in chapter 21, we have a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven to the earth. So God established the city of Jerusalem in the first place. He put his name there forever, according to 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 3. At the dedication of Solomon's temple, God said so. But he's going to give us a new Jerusalem that will come down from heaven that we can inhabit in righteousness, but not certainly in unrighteousness. And so throughout the scriptures, we get glimpses of this new world order. It isn't just found in the writings of the book of Revelation, but um, also in the lips of the prophet Isaiah. In fact, other prophets speak about it as well. But let me read what Isaiah said, wrote in Isaiah chapter 65 in verse 17. Prophetically, looking far into the future, the prophet says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing, and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. And voices have cried and wept in Jerusalem, over Jerusalem, throughout the ages. And sadly, even as I stand here this morning, they will cry again according to what the book of Revelation tells us. So 
Isaiah sees this new creation, but the Apostle Peter was also given the privilege of glimpses of the prophetic future, just as John was. And so we read in 2 Peter, his second letter, in, beginning in, in chapter 3, beginning in verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. This is a phrase that the, the prophet Joel uses as well. And the, the day of the Lord means the culmination of all things, the moment of God's judgment on the wickedness of humankind that falls short of his righteous standards. And God will come as a thief in the night. Why does, why does Peter say that? He's saying it because a, th a thief comes unannounced. He's not going to tell you that he's about to burglarize your home. And the message here is that Christ will come when people think everything is fine. Uh, and probably they're not even looking for his coming. And suddenly he comes. And we're at the end of the age and the great day of the Lord. And then these words in Peter, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? You see the emphasis on right living, on righteous living before God, according to his standards, not ours, certainly not the standards of the world around us these days. And then this, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, this encouraging word, in spite of the destruction that's going to come, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And you'll not be looking for it unless you have the faith to look for it. And that faith comes from a relationship with Jesus of Nazareth. Now, questions remain, when will it begin? When will God usher in this new world order? We have in Matthew 24 and in Luke 21, parallel accounts of things that Jesus said about the end of the age and of his coming in response to the, the questions his disciples asked him. And in those passages, we have signs of the times and we've gone over them certainly in the earlier episodes in this series and in all probably all of the other series that we've done because we need to repeat again and again the things that jesus said and the warnings that he gave there'll be wars and rumors of wars there'll be famines pestilences earthquakes in diverse places there will be false prophets but these are just the beginning of the sorrows the birth pains it's going to get worse and worse and worse until if you like, the birth or the day of the Lord, when God restores and resets the creation the way he has promised in Scripture. But we get a clue to the timing of all of this in the teaching Jesus gave in Matthew 24, in verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows. He says this even after he's given the signs. So he's saying, I can't be more specific than the signs I've already given you, but I can tell you this. No one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be, meaning suddenly, but the, the clue is in the parallel with Noah's day. So if we want to try to understand what was it about Noah's day that will be a parallel in the generation, the last generation, the terminal generation before Christ comes. So then we go back to Genesis chapter 6. Now, the Bible opens with Genesis chapter 1. And in Genesis chapter 1, as each phase of the creation occurs, the heavens, the earth, the the animals, the fish of the sea, God is saying here and there, and it was good. And there comes a point where God saw everything that he had made, and it was good. But six chapters later in Genesis 6, these words in verse 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart 
was only evil continually. In the first two episodes, but really the first episode in this series, we looked at two passages the Apostle Paul wrote in his letters to Timothy, that young pastor of the church at Ephesus. And he, did, he described the condition uh, of that generation, that they were lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. They were unthankful and holy. They were disobedient to parents. Um, it's not a, a, a pleasant picture that is painted of that generation. And it seems that we are going full circle back to where Noah's generation was. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I talk to young mothers and, and young fathers today. Um, and we're, we're producing Christian television shows. And they're telling me that they don't have, if they have a television, they don't have cable. Um, and they don't watch regular programming on television because the programming is getting so bad, they don't want their children exposed to it in any shape or form. And even a commercial these days is a risky business for parents where their children are concerned because you never know what you're going to see in the commercial. Like things have dramatically gone downhill, we could say since the 1960s, but and they're only getting worse. And what used to be shown on late night television is now shown in the morning. Certainly it, these things are on when kids could be watching and parents are out of the room and and never mind that, even the phones that the kids carry and the access to the international web and all that stuff is being bombarded at the children today. And so how are we, how are we allowing our children, their minds to be corrupted? And they didn't have this in Noah's day, but Satan will find a way and use any means to cause destruction and division in families and, and take young lives if he possibly can. He is the destroyer, Jesus said. Then verse 6, And the Lord was sorry that he had made man in the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And we know that Noah built that huge ship for his sons and their wives and, and his wife. Um, but more, there's more, another sign, and the reason I think Jesus drew attention to the generation of Noah. In verse 11, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. The clear message of the Bible, and certainly of Revelation 21, where I began this teaching, is God makes all things new. God is the restorer, the reconciler. He doesn't like division. Um, he wants families to be together, societies to be together, societies to be whole. But sadly, man and the wickedness of man and the influence of the demonic spirits and the work of Satan, who is the destroyer, is always going on behind the scene. And even though the creation is beautiful, look behind me. I'm standing, believe it or not, I'm standing on a Syrian bunker, the top of a Syrian bunker, buried in the earth on the Golan Heights. And behind me, the Hula Valley, that beautiful valley right over my shoulders, fruit-bearing, orchard-bearing valley. But between 1948 with the rebirth of Israel and 1967 and the Six-Day War in which Israel doubled her territory and in the last phase of the war captured these heights. War was necessary in order for Israel to have some sense of security and peace. And look at the world today. The world is full of violence. Man has learned nothing from the wars of the, tw the 20th century and even I'm hearing even in the news of Coptic Christians being killed, blown up in their churches on the day of worship Sunday in Cairo. I'm on the Golan Heights in Syria is that way. I'm actually within artillery range as I stand here this day. And the other day over there in Syria, not very far from here, innocent civilians were gassed by the um, Syrian government and their warplanes, and many children were killed. So when we say, well, why does God need to create a new world order? This one is beautiful. 
but man has contaminated it with violence and wickedness, and God is going to have to change the way we do business. More after this short break. Don't go away. There's more from Dr. John Tweedy after this short break. As I mentioned before that short break, I'm actually standing on the roof of a Syrian bunker uh, that was here um, when the Syrians controlled this area between 1948 with the rebirth of Israel in 1967. The Six Day War, when Israel, in the last phase of the war, at a great price, the cost of many Israeli lives, ascended the heights uh, and captured them. And behind me, actually, minefields that, and there are mines in those fields. That's why there are warning signs on the fences. They've cleared a path here and built a monument to the, uh, to the soldiers, and so we can walk safely on the path, but we dare not go over any of these fences because those mines are, are still there. Uh, just as dangerous as they were uh, all, all that while ago, 50 years ago. Anyway, the other thing is that I'm, I'm standing in the Hula Valley and we've changed the camera angle to give you a different view. You're actually looking sort of north or, or northwest and straight up through the, the Hula Valley, which is actually a bird migration route in the spring and the fall of the year uh, as the birds escape the cold winters and then of course fly back for the summer. But they fly through here so Many times, if you're here early enough in the morning, you will suddenly see the storks are, uh, sending up out of the, the long grass, and then they start to ride the thermal currents to a certain height, and then they will fly towards Africa. And it's wonderful to see that. And farther north, the border with Lebanon, and over in that direction, the border with Syria. So that's where we are as we wrap up this whole series with this final um, segment. Now, Mark Twain, the writer, the humorist, passed through this Sula Valley uh, toward the end of around 1867, 1868, and he came from Damascus in the north, in Syria. And he writes about it in his book, uh, Innocence Abroad. And he writes about coming through the Hula Valley and not being able to find a tree for shade. And he, it was, he laments the fact that this, one, this land of God is uh, even Jerusalem, lonely and neglected. And, uh, and all he wanted was a, a, a tree to get some shade from the blistering sun, which isn't too bad today, but it can be very, very hot here. So he wrote that. Now, what would Mark Twain say if he came here today? The orchards in the valley below. And, and in fact, this valley was full of swamps and mosquitoes. And so many Israeli pioneers actually died of malaria draining the swamps. But once the swamps were drained, the soil was fertile. And now look at the result. I, I wanted to do this segment here because I wanted to show you the transformation that can take place from devastation to restoration. And Israel is certainly a story of devastation, but now today, restoration. And so we are in the end of days, I believe, and God is going to make all things new according to Revelation 21, verse 5. May we be part of that. And I want to leave you and I want to conclude this series with something Jesus said. How appropriate. And I'm going to the writings of the Apostle John again, but this time in his gospel. And we've seen so much of what he wrote in the book of Revelation. But these words that he wrote, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me.